Welcome to the inaugural session of the Learning Equity and Power, or LEAP, series presented by the Center for the Study of Social Policy. My name is Anand Sharma, and I'm a senior associate at CSSP, and I'll be your host for this session. Before we jump into the conversation we have planned, uh, I wanted to share a bit about CSSP and the LEAP initiative. For those that don't know, CSSP is a national nonprofit that works to achieve a racially, economically, and socially just society in which all children and families thrive. To do this, we promote public policies grounded in equity, support strong and inclusive communities, and advocate with and for all children and families marginalized by public policies and institutional practices. We seek to transform ideas into action, and LEAP is a new initiative to help us do just that. During the session and throughout the series, we'll be highlighting and encouraging learning about what it takes to advance equity and power in communities. And we hope that you'll join us, contribute your experience and expertise, and think about how these lessons might help you more powerfully advance equity in the communities that you care about uh, and serve. Given CSSP's longstanding commitment to supporting community policy and systems change, we couldn't be more thrilled to kick off our LEAP series with today's session, how funders can help build community power. Lessons from the California Endowments Building Healthy Communities Initiative. CSSP has had the pleasure of being one of TCE's learning partners over the past few years, and we're excited to share some of the insights we and other learning evaluation partners have discovered with TCE and its many stakeholders uh, in communities across California. We are very fortunate to be joined by three wonderful guests who can help offer an entree to the large collection of research and learning, drawing on TCE's past decade of work through building healthy communities. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Sandra Witt, who serves as TC's Managing Director, Program and Partnership, Power Infrastructure Statewide. Sandra, welcome to the Leap Lab. You are our first guest. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's really, really great to be in this space with you, Anand, and Julia, and Gigi, and everybody else. And it's really great to see um, faces. So happy to be here. It is our pleasure, I assure you. So first off, just for folks that don't know, could you share a little bit about the California Endowment and its mission? Yeah, so the California Endowment is a private statewide foundation. It's a conversion foundation. I, I noticed that there were some, some conversion um, foundations in, in this space. And our mission is to expand access to affordable, quality health care for underserved communities and to promote fundamental improvements in the health status of all Californians. So mission, this mission really is in service of creating a vision for a healthy California for all, where everyone belongs and everyone is healthy. I know that over the past 10 years, you've done a lot of work with your colleagues and many partners under the name, the banner of building healthy communities. And I was wondering if you could share for folks who might not be familiar, um, how did you arrive at the BHC approach and what are some of the core uh, components of that. So Building Healthy Communities is a 10-year, very bold, ambitious, um, million do billion dollar initiative designed to promote um, healthy communities for all by really building the power and voice of the communities that are most impacted by, by health inequities to advance policy and systems change um, for racial and health equity. So it's really a very, very big, ambitious plan. Um, we just are actually uh, have just completed the 10 year cycle on building healthy, communi healthy communities. Um, it actually turns out that it was more like an investment of 1.75 billion when you add up all, all of the resources that went into this. And this includes deep, deep investment and deep relationships with 14 communities that have been impacted by, by social and health inequities along with a statewide policy and narrative change um, efforts. And I would say the core elements of, of building healthy communities are, re have, are really around people power, what we call people power, really building the power and voice of the communities most impacted. As some of our community partner organizers uh, talk about people that are closest to the pain um, and really, um, resourcing that in a way where, where they can organize, participate, and shape the decisions that impact their everyday lives and hold the systems accountable for those. And so I think over the course, I would say that, you know, what, over the course of the initiative, our understanding of what it actually means to, to, to resource and support communities in this way to, to achieve health equity has, has gotten even um, stronger um, and, it, and it's become so much more important for the work going forward. Um, 
as we're supporting groups um, to organize around issues that they care about, TCE also created sort of a broad framework and actually long story, multiple frameworks, but really kind of provided some, some, some uh, frameworks and outcomes that we thought were important for communities to work on. And then communi- the, the 14 communities then identified and prioritized those, those um, issues that they wanted to work on and, and create campaigns around. And I would just say that those are organized around health happens with prevention, which is primarily more access to healthcare, health happens in neighborhoods, issues around the built environment, community safety, et cetera, and then health happens in schools as sort of the broad issues that um, communities uh, worked on. Um, And over the course of the 10 years, there have been many, many policy wins. I think at this point, it's something like over 1,500 policy wins um, over over the course of, 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 of of that time. I think the other thing I would say that I think is a core element of of BHC is really how the foundation organized itself. Um, The role of program officers, particularly our place program officers in the 14 communities. So a program officer was actually embedded um, in, in each of those 14 communities. And I bring that up as an important part of our learning and the model because it really did and has created a different connection with the communities and the grantees um, that, that we have supported and come to know over, over the last 10 years. There's definitely a, a lot more to say. And I'll just say if anyone who's uh, tuning in, your eyes kind of glaze uh, over when you heard uh, a over a billion dollars, more like $1.75 billion Dollars. It's a lot of money, and we're, it's great that that kind of investment went toward uh, health equity. Uh, but just want to be clear that there are lots of lessons that folks can draw, even if uh, you're not funding uh, at that particular level. So uh, good for folks to know, but don't worry. There's there's a lot of insights that we think apply to uh, uh, funders of all different uh, stripes and of all different kinds. And the other point that I would just make is that obviously there's a huge interest given that TC is a health conversion uh, foundation in health equity, but that was very broadly defined. Uh, and we think that um, there's a lot of different lessons as people dig into the research, as we hope you do, uh, to learn from different cases on lots of different issue areas. Uh, and again, just lots of insights that would cut across uh, issue areas. So um, just hope that folks uh, will, will continue to dig deeper and in, in get beyond just that very quick thumbnail sketch that, that Sandra helped to, to draw. Sandra, um, before we uh, introduce our, our next guest, I really wanted to just give you a chance to say up front, what's one of the biggest lessons or insights uh, that you've drawn uh, from the past 10 years of work? And I know that's a tough question because it's 10 years and there's lots of lessons and insights, but if there was one thing that you really wanted to make sure that folks um, kept in their minds as we entered this, this conversation, uh, what would that be? I think that the main thing, um, and I'm going to kind of wrap up three three things in this, are is that we've really moved from thinking about power and supporting organizing um, as a means to a policy win, as as a means to to a campaign, to really thinking about the building of power as an end in a, in and of itself, and so really moving from. A, a specific policy win or supporting groups to, to do policy um, and systems transformation to really thinking about how is it that you'll actually build, build power and, re- and recognizing that really power, and, and we're a health conversion foundation, so really seeing power um, or lack of power as a key determinant of, of, of health equity, um, in addition to all, all the other things that we know impact health, like actually communities not having um, power is, is impacts health outcomes, um, both at an individual level and at a community level. Um, so I think that that has been a really, really important s- switch, which then if, if we're thinking about not just funding towards a particular policy win, um, really thinking about like, what's the infrastructure and the capacity that are needed long term uh, to really support the kind of transformation that we are envisioning. Um, If we're really thinking about the big things of dismantling white supremacy and achieving racial and health equity for everybody, right? So I think that 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 has been a real switch in our thinking. Um, And I think related to that is this concept that you'll be hearing more about, but this concept of a power ecosystem that while it's incredibly important to resource the 
organizing groups, the grassroots, the, the base building um, groups um, to build their capacity and their power and their voice, um, that it's also important that that alone will not get us to the big structural changes that we want to see. And really we're influenced by um, Jennifer Ito's work uh, with the, with the uh, USC, University of Southern California, Borneo Research, um, what is it called? Equity Research Institute, which kind of laid out for us conceptually um, this, this map of thinking about like how we think, be, how we begin thinking about the, the power ecosystem. And, and Gigi has helped you know, advance that or think about that as well going forward. And you'll be hearing more about that. Um, but really understanding that, I think like that, 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 that piece around it's not just enough to, to, to we need to fund organizing really in, in ways that really support the field um, for long, long, um, long term, uh, long term change, um, not just for a particular campaign. Um, and that that really need to think about it within the context of a broader ecosystem, power ecosystem, so that um, so that the things that we're helping to support the other research, the other organizations are really in service of of the, the, the people that are most impacted who are at the center of the power ecosystem. And then really organizing and really broadening and thinking, and, and, and our partners really called us on this, like how is it that you're really centering racial equity in this? Thank you, Sandra. You've done a wonderful Thank job. You. No, th those are all great. And you've done a wonderful job laying out some of the big um, issues and elements of the strategy. And I think folks are definitely interested in the role of the foundation and what that means for program officers. So we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit because um, I know it's a question that you all have thought a lot about over the past 10 years and as you think about your work going forward. Uh, but before we do that, I want to bring in our next guest. We are very excited to have uh, Gigi Barsoom, who is the founder and principal of Barsoom Policy Consulting. And Gigi is a uh, person with a lot of experience in uh, both in philanthropy and research and evaluation. And she is one of the many, many learning and evaluation partners that has been on this learning journey. So uh, Gigi, welcome to the first Leap Lab. Thank you, Anand. So Sandra teed up this um, idea of power building and said a little bit about that. But I know that that's a term that uh, organizing and power building people are increasingly using and, and talking about. But can you help us uh, understand how do you think about power building and how do you kind of unpack that concept in that process? How I unpacked the whole concept around power and power building was actually in partnership and when I had the opportunity to evaluate a group of grassroots organizing uh, groups and the electoral campaigns that they implemented around progressive district attorneys in several cities. Um, and the framework that, are, that I developed really emerged from that work and understanding um, how they approached these campaigns and how they were using them as not just a means to get progressive DAs elected, but as a means to build power. And as Sandra was saying, that within this conceptualization, then power is both a means to advance progressive policy goals uh, as well as an ends, that it's something that groups are, are, are building through their advocacy work. So the conceptualization of power here is really grounded in communities and those communities in particular who are impacted by inequities. And what the framework tries to describe is how, as Sandra was talking about, that um, Organizations don't do this work alone, but they do it as an ecosystem. And this ecosystem that builds power must and does center communities. And in order for communities to be centered, grassroots organizing groups become very important because of the role they play in terms of both engaging, building the leadership and mobilizing communities on the issues that they have prioritized. So this ecosystem, which is described here in the framework as the building power component, is really characterized by the relationships among the groups, the, the array of and diversity of groups in the ecosystem, um, 
the shared vision and analysis that help them to align on areas of interest, the infrastructure in the ecosystem that facilitates their coordination and collaboration, uh, and the capacities that are needed in the ecosystem. So as Sandra was saying about the peer power flower, this conceptualization of the, frame, of, uh, the ecosystem builds on that and moves beyond just the typologies of organizations in the ecosystem to really focus on the capacities that are needed to build power. And that includes organizing, obviously, which is the most important, but also advocacy capacities, electoral and civic engagement capacities, governing capacity, narrative change capacity, uh, adaptive capacity of an ecosystem, as well as developmental capacities and developmental both for organizations in the ecosystem as well as individuals. So what the, the framework then tries to show is how these ecosystems then wield their collective capacities and strategies to exercise their power in what often grassroots organizing groups describe as campaigns. These campaigns can be policy change efforts, they can be electoral efforts, they can be monitoring and implementation efforts, whatever the social change uh, strategy is, that is then captured within exercising power. Um, Having power, which is the third component of this cyclical process, are the outcomes. It's as Sandra was talking about those 1500 plus wins, but it's also losses because power can also be built through losses. Um, so it's the policy change wins, it's the electoral wins and losses. It's also shifts in politics and um, also changes on, in the community level. But the framework, I think the most unique aspect of it, it doesn't stop there. What it attempts to do is move beyond these wins and look at how power shifted and changed and increased. And that's the portion of the framework that's described as expanding power. And how the framework does this is it looks at changes in power both in terms of what the literature describes as both hidden power, which I describe as capacities, and the visible power, which are uh, which I describe as the influence of organizations. And it looks at this on four levels. The individual level, because in grassroots organizing, individuals are central to building power. How they are transformed from into leaders who then have influence. And that influence can be manifest, either they may run for office or they're in positions of influence, uh, sitting at, at um, tables of decision makers or being perceived as influential by decision makers. Um, it also looks at both hidden and visible power on the organizational and the ecosystem level. So, for example, changes in capacity, both on the organization and ecosystem level, uh, new organizations that come into the ecosystem, increased relationships, strength of relationships, new capacities of the ecosystem. And then in terms of looking at their influence, how are they perceived by decision makers? Are they per perceived as a collective force? Something that decision makers need to look at in terms of their calculus, uh, in, in terms of, of their influence and whether they need to ally with these entities um, or see them as a threat. And then finally, the last um, level that the framework looks at to assess changes in power are geographic. And that's because within organizing, as you're probably all familiar, organizers um, build power and organize communities door to door, community by community, region by region. And so as their base expands regionally, that is also a shift and a change in power that extends across regions and extends across states. But what the power framework also then tries to show is it doesn't end there. All of that power that is built through each of these campaigns is then leveraged in the next cycle, the next policy goal, the next effort to monitor 
uh, a policy that's just been passed. So it's this constant cyclical process that happens over time where organizations and ecosystems engage in campaigns, build power and continue to leverage it to achieve their longer term transformative goal. And I'll just give you a real world example that we've just experienced here in California. So many of you know about the recall election that just happened in California that was soundly dismissed. And that was because of the work of these organizing groups across the state that have been funded over the last decade to create this strong network of organizing groups that are working on electoral policy and efforts to create change. Um, and this, this statewide network of organizations mobilized communities of color against this, uh, uh, this campaign to recall the governor. And this work has been happening over the last decade and is also grounded in the BHC work because this is part of what the endowment has been funding in terms of an ecosystem across, uh, across the state and for the last decade that also connected to the BHC sites to help build their electoral capacity and overlay electoral organizing into their grassroots organizing efforts. And as a result, that's what actually helped to create the ability of the state to actually um, defeat this ballot measure. And what's interesting about that, and again, you see the cyclical process of wielding power, the same night we knew the results of the election, organizing groups and advocacy groups already were pushing on the governor to sign uh, policies that they had been advancing related to criminal justice and reproductive justice reforms. So you can see how they wielded the power that they were able to build through this campaign to continue to advance their policy goals. So it's all connected and it's all part of the cyclical process. And I think it helps to give folks a more nuanced way of thinking about uh, power and the different ecosystem uh, players and, and capacity. So it's really, really helpful. Um, we want to invite to our last guest uh, for this conversation, uh, Julia Coffin, to, to join um, this um, discussion about lessons from BHC. And, and uh, Julia Coffin is the co-director and founder of the Center for Valuation Innovation and so many other things. Uh, but she has been one of the wonderful partners we at CSSP have had the pleasure of working with. And she has really looked at advocacy um, throughout the BHC experience. So I wanted to just start uh, by asking you, how do funders in your experience and research tend to approach advocacy? And kind of how did that approach evolve over the course of, of BHC? As you just said, we at CEI, in collaboration with Gigi, looked at the role of advocacy in BHC and what it really means for advocacy to build power. And I'm a longtime advocacy evaluator, and this was a pretty transformative experience for me um, in thinking about you know, what success looks like for advocacy. Um, so quickly, just to be clear about my use of terms and, and what I mean by advocacy, um, or I'm, I'm using it to mean the sustained actions taken to achieve policy wins or systems changes. So using it synonymously with campaigns, and that's different from um, you know, what we mean by organizing and grassroots organizing, and uh, which has as its central purpose, the building of power. Um, but my main point here today that I wanna lead with is that um, foundations don't have to just fund organizing in order to build power. Sandra mentioned that, and I wanna um, emphasize that advocacy and campaigns that are designed to achieve specific wins can also build power as long as communities are centered in the work. Um, so in my experience with advocacy funders, um, uh, foundations that support advocacy uh, historically have measured success by whether that that win or that systems change has been achieved. Um, did the campaign succeed in passing a new policy? Was a program, um, you know, was the campaign successful in getting a program funded? And those are important goals for sure. Um, but when the singular focus is just on what it takes to win, uh, that approach comes up short for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which, of course, is that wins are vulnerable. 
Uh, they uh, often come under attack when the political cold, uh, climate changes, et cetera. But, um, and, and so they're under threat unless there can be a sustained effort or constituency in place to protect the win, as Gigi was just talking about in California um, with the growth of, of that ecosystem. Um, but this approach also comes up short for foundations that care about advancing racial equity and justice uh, with their grant making. So if, if advancing equity is the goal, then how we think about the success of advocacy also has to pay attention to what was won. You know, does the win help to address racial disparities and their root causes, um, as well as how it was won? Um, were communities impacted by the problem um, uh, involved and centered in that work uh, to, to um, yeah, to involved and centered in the advocacy effort. So it's not just did the win happen, but what did the win look like and how, how did you get to that win? Um, and then ultimately, the ultimate measure of success for um, advocacy is whether power was built uh, as a result, whether, whether there was a win or as Gigi just said, whether there was a loss, was power built. Um, and for BHC, that shift toward thinking about power as the ultimate goal uh, happened midpoint through the initiative. They, they literally called it a pivot to power. There's a publication um, that has that, that title. Um, when uh, you know, pe people power came to be considered um, it, it, it was initially considered a driver of policy and systems change, and then it became the change itself that BHC um, sought to achieve. This table up here that you see on the screen um, is in our evaluation report, and it is just an attempt to, to be clearer about what is different about advocacy just designed to achieve a win versus advocacy that is designed to, to win and um, achieve power. And just a couple of examples there that the, the policy solution, uh, if you're just focused on a win, may or may not be informed by impacted communities. Whereas if advocacy is designed to build power, it is developed or informed by impacted communities. Um, and the just one more that advocacy strategy if you're just thinking about a win the strategy is really focused on an analysis of the political opportunity and politics versus um, with power strategy is based on a shared analysis that's grounded in uh, a consideration of root causes and um, of inequities and i want to invite uh, sandra and gigi back into the the conversation and i think um, Sandra, I'd love to start with you. In terms of the way that this work has changed over the past uh, 10 years, and as Julie and Gigi have talked about, this isn't necessarily the way that foundations operate. Even TCE went through some dramatic changes uh, in its uh, view of this work and its philanthropic practice, and would love for you to share a little bit um, about the role of the program officer. Uh, folks may be interested to hear a little bit more about what that means to have been embedded um, in the course of, of BHC. And I know you all are thinking about what are the implications of uh, viewing power uh, versus you know, just wins. It's wins and power, I should say, as kind of the thing that you're after. What are the implications of that for the way that you think about strategy and organize yourselves uh, as a foundation going forward? I'll say a little bit about the sort of the role of, of the foundation and, and the program managers. I think like many foundations, TCE has always um, has always wanted to listen um, and, and, and to to the perspectives of, of communities um, as the, as it's developed its programming um, through the we're now celebrating, I think, 25 years of, of, of being in existence. And so I think there's always been this orientation to listen, to, you know, to engage and get community input. But I think in building healthy communities, there was a real, a real change in, in, in what that actually really meant. Um, and this notion of, of having a program manager um, assigned to a particular geographic location, a place, one of those 14 places, um, many times living, being part of that community, living in that community for most of them, um, others assigned living close by, but really responsible for 
thinking about how is it that the foundation would be responsive to the priorities that are emerging in those places in terms of really impacting sort of the social economic conditions that, that impact poor, poor, poor health outcomes um, and what was needed. And that process, I think, really created a level of connection, a le level of um, uh, accountability um, that is was really important for us as we, and, and really helped us as a foundation actually change and shift and adjust and learn through that process. I don't know, um, I, so I think the connection um, and the relationships that, that, that have been both because you're really connected and proximate as we say um, sometimes to the communities as well as the long-term commitment um, uh, to that relationship um, and the struggles of what that actually really means. Um, like, you know, this, this work is, as you can, uh, there's a lot of power dynamics in this work. It's not easy, it's, it's messy, but the long-term commitment to be in that relationship and figure out what's really needed and how we as a foundation um, can be more res responsive, uh, um, sometimes even real time, I think, is um, is 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 something that that has has uh, has been really important for us as we've sort of been really thinking about how do how do we do this work, and so now, uh, so the role of the of the program manager, I think, is was really or really connected to that, and our commitment um, and our learning that we actually had to be in real in, in in much more real relationships, and what did that mean for us in terms of the power that we uh, that we bring to to that relationship? Um, I think that um, so. I think that's that's the piece that I just want to highlight here. Now, it's not possible to always do that. You know, there's other ways to 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 um, to make sure that the connection with um, our partners are is 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 uh, is uh, front and center. But I think that you know this this notion of of really being able to real time listen to what the is issues are, the struggles, adapt, figure out how to best support that that ecosystem because you, you know, each 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 site is a is an ecosystem as well, right? So thinking about how you help support um, the efforts of, of of the groups is a piece of it. And I think that that has really and, and why I'm highlighting this is I think is really important because I also think that has helped us really do a couple of things. One is like really look internally around like, it, it's not just enough to be thinking about how we promote equity, how we think about um, structural racism, how that plays out um, in, in our communities, but it's also important to really think about we as institutions, how we are uh, operating and how we may unintentionally be perpetuating some of the inequities. And so that, that requires a real um, looking internally um, and building our own uh, skills and capacities and understandings around, around, um, around structural racism, around racism, around how that impacts the work that we're doing, how we yield power um, or not, how we share power, how we shift, how we shift our power. And then, you know, how we actually think about um, our, uh, our policies and practices and, and, um, and how those either help facilitate um, the work of our partners or actually make it more difficult. Um, and so I think that that piece that has really led to a very intentional focus um, from our board and our leadership to really think about how we become an anti-racist institution, as well as, you know, thinking about trust-based philanthropy and what does that actually mean to operationalize and embody that practice. And so we're in the middle of all this. We do not have all the answers. This is a long-term journey. But I think that BHC has been um, has been a gift to the foundation as well uh, because of, because it has forced us to really kind of look internally and think uh, about how it is that um, how that how it is that we can shift power in in, in different ways. Oh, I appreciate that, Sandra, and I appreciate you talking about things you're still grappling with and how messy this is because when you're sharing lessons at the end of 10 years and after the graphic designers get a handle on all of the lessons, everything looks super neat and like, oh yeah, we just had the table. Look at figure 6B. That's that's what you do. That's how you figure it out. But there's a lot of um, hard won experience um, and learning behind that. And that's exactly the kind of spirit of the conversation we're hoping to have 
uh, in these Leap Lab sessions. So appreciate you just being uh, open about, about that path. I wanted to bring in uh, Gigi and, and Julia on this conversation about implications of this way of working, of focusing on power building for philanthropic strategy and specifically something Sandra teed up, which is the um, what I know both of you have referred to as a centering uh, organizing grassroots organizing groups. And, and Gigi, maybe if you want to jump in your thoughts on that or, or anything else um, in this conversation about philanthropic strategy. Just a couple of things I'd like to follow up on that Sandra mentioned. One, the messiness of this work. Um, and I think that's because funders are part of the ecosystem. Um, they are not outside of it, kind of pulling strings or deciding where to allocate resources. Uh, in a vacuum, but they are part of the ecosystem and that has implications for how they relate to organizations, the work they're doing, their knowledge of the ecosystem, how it's operating, what it's doing, what it's prioritizing, and what role the foundation can play as a result. And one of the things that we found in um, the evaluation of the BHC that's documented in both of the reports in the eight case studies that we did across the state um, was that the foundation played variable roles under differing conditions. It was very fluid. And it's what I describe as a spectrum of directionality um, as opposed to kind of this dichotomy of uh, of strategic and responsive, it's a spectrum um, in which the organization was much more top-down, uh, the foundation could be much more top-down and directive depending on the conditions, or really took a backseat, just funded the work, supported the organizations, and took the lead of the, organ of the organizations and the ecosystem. And it was very contextual. It depended on the readiness of the field. Did they have sufficient capacities? Were they able to act quickly enough depending on the policy window of opportunity? What were the conditions? And based on that, the foundation shifted and modified almost um, intuitively. And I think recognizing this and doing it more intentionally and gathering sufficient information to be more intentional around that can actually help funders in their work in terms of being a stronger ecosystem partner. This experience taught me something really important about what foundation strategy means for um, foundations that are working on, uh, as Sandra was describing, giving up power or shifting power uh, to communities. And I think this is a question that's coming up for a number of foundations who are, who are thinking about or starting to move more toward trust-based grant making, the question is, well, what if I'm not making strategy, then what am I doing? Or what does strategy mean for me? And so um, in the case of BHC, as you know, the communities were the strategists, they were identifying the goals and identifying how to get there. The foundation was, was an actor in that system. But, but you know, so, so strategy lived at that at, with, with communities. And so for the foundation, the strategy really became, how do I, as a program officer, support that power ecosystem to make sure that um, the actors in it that who need to be in it are, are present, that the capacities exist, that I am making connections where I need to make connections and all of that. And so that became the definition of what foundation strategy was, not the how do I get to that goal? I mean, there was a shared goal there. You know, so the point that Anand made ver very early on that sometimes the work of the endowment can be intimidating or off-putting to other funders because it's like a one point something billion dollar investment. But I'd like to note that even within the Building Healthy Communities Initiative, the endowment didn't do it alone, but they often did it in partnership with other funders, statewide, sometimes national funders, and definitely local family funders and community-based foundations were critical in, in that work regionally in supporting 
these ecosystems on a local and regional level. And even to the example that I used earlier in terms of the recall, this statewide network that's focused on electoral strategies was funded by a group of funders in California across the last decade. It wasn't just TCE, but it was that collective intentionality around building an ecosystem that was needed to build power. So that funder collaboration and funders seeing themselves as part of, of, of an ecosystem and how they need to work together towards that shared goal is also really important. So before we close out, uh, I wanted to give each of our guests a chance to just share any final thoughts and, and takeaways um, that they hope other uh, funders will reflect on and, and keep in mind as you know they're trying to uh, engage with the learnings from, from BHC and see what implications it might have for, for their own work. Uh, and I'll go in reverse order this time. I'd love to give Julia a chance to share any closing thoughts. And yeah, what's your advice to funders out there who may be listening? Just to, to repeat my main point um, with a little more, which is that foundations don't just have to fund organizing in order to build power. So in that power building ecosystem, you have advocates, you've got researchers, you've got think tanks, you've got um, legal organizations, you've got um, you know, lots of different kinds of, of actors. And so so you're, so the question that you end up asking is, okay, well, what does it mean for researchers who study problems and develop policy recommendations to center communities? What does it mean for our communications consultants? What does it mean for evaluators like, like um, us to think about power as our goal and to um, center communities in the work? So that's my main takeaway. Kind of my concluding reflection would be on taking the long view um, that none of this work happens overnight, whether it's policy change or using policy change to build longer term infrastructure within an ecosystem that's lasting. Um, so it, it's taking the long view, doing it with intentionality and doing it consistently over time and in collaboration. And Sandra will give you the final word. Building Healthy Communities is a 10-year initiative. Now we're moving into, um, we're tr transitioning into what we're calling Beyond 2020. And the big goal, and it really, I think, piggybacks very nicely with, with Julia and um, Gigi have said, the big goal that we have set out is California has a robust intergenerational power building ecosystem for advancing health justice and racial equity by 2030. So that is another big, huge, ambitious goal. And I think that really thinking about how we actually um, can better support the, the, the power ecosystem, really teasing out the, the capacities, the infrastructure that's needed, but doing it, in, doing it with our partners so that they are the ones that are really helping uh, leading this work in terms of identifying what exactly is needed and what works. That's a lot of the work ahead in, and just would really appreciate and look forward to working, um, continuing to work with many of you, but also additional funders around how we grapple with some of those big, um, those big questions to really create the transformational change that we all, we all want to see. Thank you, Sandra. And I just wanted to note that um, there are a huge set of resources and reports that draw on lessons from, from BHC. There were a couple that were mentioned here, and if folks are really uh, curious, uh, Julia mentioned uh, Advocacy That Builds Power. That's a report that she um, and a whole lot of other people that I, I won't have time to, to mention uh, completed. And there was a companion report that Gigi was um, drawing a lot of lessons and, and remarks from an ecosystem to build power and advance health and racial equity. So we hope folks check those out along with a whole bunch of other uh, resources that um, we hope to share with you throughout this series. So I wanna thank Julia, Sandra and Gigi for sharing their insights and their time uh, in this uh, launch to our, our Leaf Lab series. Uh, I want to thank the California Endowment for allowing us to be a, a learning partner and for um, allowing us to give this platform to dig into these really difficult questions around uh, what it takes to learn from, build equity, 
and power in communities. And most of all, I want to thank everyone that tuned in. Uh, this is just the first of many LEAP series, and we hope that you'll uh, check out future ones so that you can learn more from uh, the experience of, of building healthy communities.